In 1987, Robocop became a surprising success thanks to the collaboration of writers Edward Niemeyer and Michael Miner, the directorial vision of Paul Verhoeven, and a script that blended contemporary satire with intense violence. The film's premise revolves around a future Detroit that privatizes its police force, leading the Omni Consumer Products Corporation to transform the critically injured cop, Alex Murphy, into a cybernetic law enforcement officer. Throughout the original film, news broadcasts interject and offer darkly comic glimpses of the future through the lens of 1980s sensibilities. Robocop soon became an icon of 1980s pop culture and film history, and the cult following it spawned remains strong even today. Frank Miller, a die-hard fan of the original Robocop, eagerly embraced the opportunity to bring his unique touch to the film industry. However, Miller's original screenplay was considered unfilmable and underwent substantial revisions, ultimately being rewritten by Waylon Green. But, of course, the film was heavily criticized. Miller's original script became an urban legend and was shrouded in mystery until 2003, when Avatar Press transformed it into a limited comic series titled Frank Miller's Robocop. The comic series Robocop serves as a platform to present Frank Miller's original version for the story. This adaptation draws directly from Miller's initial writings and scripts, incorporating the majority of his audacious concepts, dark humor, and robotic chaos, which never made it to the big screen. The project features a sequential adaptation by Stephen Grant and artwork by the renowned Juan Jose Rip. Frank Miller himself provides the series covers and is personally involved in the entire project. So, without further ado, let's explore this awesome nine-issue comic that is truly what Robocop 2 should have been. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. You're a cop. You don't strike. The comic begins with something called The Luke Spindle Show. Luke Spindle is the worst possible talk show host ever. He's vile, he's arrogant, he's mean, and has no regard for just about any social, moral, or ethical constraints. The show was being aired on a day when the cops of old Detroit had been on strike. So although the general population paid their arm and a leg as taxes, tonight, no one was going to save them from the wrath of the criminals, who were having a free-for-run that night. It's actually reminded me of the basic plot of the Purge film franchise, where a seemingly utopian country is actually a state of dystopia, where criminals get a free reign of terror for 12 hours every year, and everything from murder to bombings is decriminalized. Anyway, coming back to our story, the audience in the talk show narrates their ordeals to Spindle and the cop guests. The people could not go to the grocery store, men and women were getting robbed, and even little kids couldn't go out and play. But our Frank Miller's crude humor shines in these panels. Anyway, the real question is, why were the cops on strike? Well, according to them, no man or woman on the force wanted the strike to happen. However, they are heavily outnumbered, outgunned, and underpaid. And to make things worse, OCP, the corporation running the show in Old Detroit, had stopped giving a flying duck to the deterioration conditions. The cops believed that the city sold them out to a corporation that was way more concerned with the almighty dollar than public safety. To this, Spindle asked the lady cop if she was frustrated because she wasn't getting laid, and even offered her his beef noodle. Of course, a massive punch landed on Spindle's face, making his face dirty. Contrary to what you may think, Spindle faces the camera and says, It gets better. Stay tuned. Robocop's spectacularly bloody and brutal entry. The company was offering to turn the crime-ridden old Detroit into Delta City, a city of dreams where everyone would have jobs, houses would have state-of-the-art appliances, basically a city with no poverty and no crime. But Delta City would be brought up only after raising down the old city, after destroying homes and families. In fact, the process had already started. In one such incident, when a building was being raised down, a father-daughter duo found themselves caught in the falling building. While the father lost his life, he managed to save his daughter. Meanwhile, the rest of the city found itself engulfed in the fire of uncontrolled crime. The little girl, Christine, ran for her life amidst the streets that were running amok with criminals. How far could a young girl possibly go before getting grabbed by bad guys? Well. That's exactly what happened. Christine got kidnapped by a criminal couple 
who seemingly wanted to sell her off, but there was one cop who wasn't off duty, one cop who did not participate in the strike. Any guesses? Well, of course, this was our half-robot, half-human killing machine. He was practically the cyborg Batman to old Detroit. Robocop was getting live updates about the plethora of crimes taking place all across Detroit, but his primary objective was saving innocent lives more than anything else. As soon as he learned about Christine, he started going after the car that had her. The female kidnapper probably soiled her pants after learning they were being pursued by Robocop himself, but it seemed that Silvio, the driver, thought it was a good idea to pull his gun on Robocop. Dumb way to die, Silvio. What a dumb way to die. Before Silvio could do anything else, Robocop's metallic arm smashed through the car's window and pulled Silvio out. The female kidnapper tried the same stunt in a desperate bid to escape, but Robocop fired his weapon through the barrel of the woman's gun, puncturing her chest. Next, Robocop's attention turned to Silvio, who rattled out everything he knew. He squealed about how he was but a small pawn in the great game being played at Chrysler Factory, but Silvio had tried to sell a little girl, and he would have exploited her if Robocop hadn't shown up. And to Robocop, the punishment for such crime is death. The man who used to be Alex James Murphy pulled out the scared child and brought her to safety before going after the kingpins of this human trafficking racket. We learn that these guys were kidnapping children and selling them to those who paid a good price, including parents who could not conceive or legally adopt. Nevertheless, all of that was to be brought to an end as Robocop entered the scene, guns blazing. He wasted no time in offing people. One dude was so scared that he ran with all his energy only to ram into a wall and die. Robocop took a major hit as the bad guys tried to shoot his mouth, the only seemingly weak spot that Robocop had. But he still managed to take everyone down, but stopped when the boss pointed his gun at a young kid and offered Robocop a choice, kill himself or let the kid die. Robocop 2, an upgraded monstrosity. Of course, nothing could be possibly dumber than threatening Robocop, and the old man paid the price. The cyborg hero shot a bullet straight into the gun-holding wrist. Meanwhile, a popular psychiatrist named Margaret Love was doing a live interview when she was criticizing Robocop and what he represented. In fact, she went as far as to say that the toys based on Robocop promoted aggression, hostility, and violence things that could easily permeate into the impressionable minds of children. But hold on, this woman was no saint herself. It wasn't before long that she started working for Omni Consumer Products. Money changes mentality. Mrs. Love suddenly became an ardent supporter of Robocop and how he was inadvertently spreading the notions of violence and bloodshed, while in reality, he has been what the city had needed. He was the protector that the city did not deserve. But in reality, she had been hired by OCP to change the public mindset, and Dr. Love had been sold out. Meanwhile, the strike was still on, and Robocop had more people to protect. Taking advantage of the situation, a vile sexual predator sought to hunt down a hooker on the streets of Old Detroit, falsely believing that there was no one there to protect her from him. But of course, Robocop was prowling the streets, looking for bad guys who would hurt those who would not protect themselves. Robocop saved her and went on, but not everything was fine. He was having some flashbacks in the form of distorted visions of memories from a time he wasn't Robocop, when he was a happy married man with a child. That stopped when Robocop reached his station. The car was in a dilapidated state when he returned back, but it wasn't just the car that was a mess. Robocop had been injured brutally, bleeding from his neck. The station itself was in a mess, with the entire city calling in to report crime and seek help. To make things worse, Robocop fell unconscious. He hadn't slept for more than a week and hadn't had any repairs in the past three days. An ambulance was immediately called in, and Robocop was taken to the hospital. The doctors believed that Robocop was breathing his last breath, and to add more confusion to the chaos, Dr. Love was also present at the same hospital. He was disoriented initially and had lost the sense of space and time, but after a few repairs, he seemed to gain some semblance of who he was. When asked who he was, Robocop replied with that he was once a man, which means that he was still sentimental and had emotions. 
In fact, he was still somewhat attached to his human memories. Once the repairs were fully completed, Robocop gained his complete senses. This is when they first had a real brush with Margaret Love, who wanted to psychoanalyze the cyborg cop, but she had bound his hands in order to see him react to the situation. Robocop was clearly showing some signs of hostility, and Dr. Love was there to assess him. You see, OCP didn't want someone like Robocop to have emotions or retain any memories. It would mean that he would move mountains to do the right things. You can compare him with Michael Fassbender's David from the new Alien movies. The only difference was that David was a menace, while Robocop was a good guy. When Robocop didn't cooperate with Dr. Love's interrogation, the cruel woman subjected him to an electric shock. Crazily enough, she wanted him to address her as mom. I hope you know what she meant. The woman had a certain kink. But OCP was cooking something far more sinister. They had created a monstrosity based on Robocop. This beast had infinite destructive capability for a cyborg and was commanded by a series of unique organic and software systems. Dr. Fleck, the man behind this new beast, presented his creation as Robocop 2. Kong the Killer Fortunately, Robocop 2 was severely unstable. The first thing he did after coming online was smashing the head of a super unfortunate staff. But the anomaly didn't stop there and he ended up taking his own life, or shall we say, pulling his own plug. The real reason why Dr. Love was brought into the project is revealed, to find and prepare the right mind for the next Robocop. The setbacks, like Robocop 2, were proving to be very expensive, and OCP didn't want that anymore. There had been six such lost Robocops, and each of them failed either because of insufficient conditioning or because the subject's mind wasn't appropriate to become the cyborg cop. An OCP official tells Dr. Love that Murphy was a hero in police action, a man who was dedicated to his work, had a stable home life, and was as good a cop as you can find. But Dr. Love didn't want a good man for the job. She noted that Murphy was driven by strict and rigid religious and moral values. His sense of right and wrong began to corrupt his program as soon as he was ordered to force innocent citizens from their homes. She wanted a value-neutral subject who would be cooperative, and she had just the right man in her mind. With Robocop being considered to be unfit for active duty, a new armed force came into the picture. This was a bunch of trigger-happy and ruthless men in uniform who called themselves the Urban Rehabilitation Officers. As the strike was still on, a group of regular middle-class men were trying to steal a few guns for the protection of their families and homes. A Detroit cop understood what they were doing and tried to handle the situation peacefully. But then came Kong, an urban rehabilitation officer. As would have been expected, he shot down the men and didn't even spare the cop. She pulled a gun on him, but he unpinned a grenade and launched it on her. She miraculously survived, but Kong fled. The rehabs were basically the OCP muscle men in uniform and ambushed a house to evict innocent residents. But Robocop stepped in and thwarted the attempt. Clearly, now he was going against his parent organization. In the scuffle that broke out, Robocop killed one of the rehabs. Just as the dead man landed on the car down below, Kong arrived. It turned out that Kong and the dead rehab were close buddies, and seeing his friend's bloody and lifeless body infuriated him who then tried to confront the cyborg cop. Kong was a huge man, but at the same time, he was quite agile. He climbed the walls and entered the house of one of the residents, killing them. But that's not all. Kong marked his forehead with his victim's blood, which was too much for Robocop to take. The two of them engaged in close quarters combat, and Robocop seemingly overpowered Kong. However, the rehab tried to kill Robocop with a grenade. Acting swiftly, Robocop shot the grenade, which exploded in Kong's hand, obliterating his arm. Seeing this, the other rehab shot an RPG that vaporized Robocop's arm. Robocop goes haywire. Murphy was subsequently taken to be repaired under Dr. Love's care, or shall I say supervision. She firmly believed that Robocop would become more gullible and obedient if he let go of his human memories. And for this, she had to ensure that he was willing to move on. Dr. Love brought in Ellen Murphy, who was now married and pregnant with her new husband's child. She was not there out of love or concern, but she wanted a verbal agreement from Murphy that their marriage was over, and with his arms gone, Murphy wasn't really in a state to sign any papers. The cyborg cop wept, for his beloved was going away 
forever, which is when Dr. Love reappeared before Murphy and convinced him that his delusions about his past life were bringing him pain. He was once again subjected to shocks, so much so that his mechanical parts were fuming. Murphy's memories were erased completely, and he was made to remember only as much as he needed to. For instance, how to use his body. Next thing we know, Robocop was removed from the active crime-fighting duty and put in public relations. His new directives included stuff like not seeming suspicious, restraining hostile feelings, promoting positive attitudes, and suppressing aggressive emotions. Basically, Dr. Love was chopping off Robocop's claws, and if Robocop went against the directives, he would be hurt from within. Because Dr. Love had twitched his discipline system, he was sent with a camera crew so that they could record him being nice, a vile attempt at improving public perception towards Robocop, in particular, and OCP in general. The cyborg lost whatever little personality he had in himself and would repeat stuff like, Conservation serves the public good. Conservation is pro-social. Bad words make for bad feelings. However, things didn't go quite as planned because Robocop was now hunting down people who were saying bad words and letting off those who committed armed robbery but didn't say bad words. Meanwhile, Dr. Love was two hours away from deploying the new Robocop. She contacted Carl Schultz and asked him to come up with an excuse to take Murphy offline forever. Only an atrocity like a dead cop would have been reason enough for Dr. Love's superiors and the media to believe that Robocop was nothing more than a menace to Detroit. Carl sent in a sniper named Gillette to take down Sergeant Warren Reed, Murphy's old boss from the original movie. The female cop, Lewis, who had brushed with Kong earlier, came to meet the sergeant. He reveals that the rehabs were basically some kind of black ops division who killed without the fear of consequences. They always wore red because it kept the blood from showing. And now that they have been deployed in Detroit, it was as good as dropping a nuke on the city. Warren was suggesting Lewis got out of town like he was, but before he could say anything else, he was shot dead by Gillette. Lewis managed to escape, but a bullet grazed her foot. Kong becomes the psychotic Robocop. Gillette was hot on her trail, and she was well aware of that if she was caught, nothing on Earth would be able to save her from a sorry death. So she got into her car and asked to be connected with Murphy because of the police strike. Central Dispatch told her that due to staff shortages, her call would not be taken at the moment. She wanted to contact Murphy, knowing well that he was the only one who could possibly help her in such a dire situation. Lewis found herself in a car chase with Gillette shooting at her without any fear. After a while, their cars rammed into each other and gunfire was exchanged, but their guns ran empty, which led both of them to draw their knives. The fight didn't last long as Lewis somehow managed to stick her weapon into Gillette, killing him for good. But of course, she still wasn't safe. A rehab chopper arrived at the scene, and Lewis once again found herself in the line of fire. With nothing left to do, Lewis had to make an escape once again, this time in Gillette's cruiser. The chopper was asked to move out, and another rehab named Swenson was asked to take care of Lewis. In a very wise move, she came to the only place she knew she'd be protected, a cafe where all the cops hung out. Swenson followed her soon after, but she was probably scared to death when she saw a hundred guns pointed at him. He immediately gave up his tough man persona and earned a punch from Lewis. The fact that Warren Reed had been murdered became a turning point for the cops. They wanted revenge. Lewis convinced them to get back to work and arrest the rehabs for Warren's murder. Meanwhile, a taped simulation was being aired on TV that showed Robocop killing Reed. Detroit's superhero, technology's answer to the plague of crime, had killed his former boss. OCP then led the story and said that the terrorist organizations had installed a rogue program into Robocop's system. During his routine rounds, Robocop, still under the pro-social program that Dr. Love had installed, shot a man dead for simply smoking. Next thing we know, there's a large explosion at the train station, and from the fire and smoke emerged Robocop 2, a hulking monstrosity, recently fitted with fine and shining armor and a range of astonishing weapons. His directives were simple and asked to be accessible to OCP employees at all times. And that's quite what Robocop 2 did, but he held no qualms for collateral damage. In a bid to take down Robocop, this upgraded version killed a guard. Things had started to look ugly for Detroit, as it was becoming more and more evident that Robocop 2 would soon spiral out of control. 
You ask me how? Well, this guy was actually Kong Rehab. We know it because, much like Kong, Robocop 2 also marked his cyborg head with the blood of the security guard. Dr. Margaret Love's Tryst with Power Robocop greeted the rehab guys, but they didn't want to fight him. Instead, they called their newly created super weapon, Kong, the Robocop 2. The two cyborgs were about to have an epic face-off, but Murphy was clearly the underdog here. Given just how huge and bulky our man Kong was in comparison, Murphy shot Kong, but the bullet had literally no effect on him. It seemed as if Kong was built as a sink for incoming damage, and he could take as much punishment as you could possibly deliver. Kong grabbed Murphy and threw him across the room. Getting beaten up to a pulp and getting manhandled like a rag doll was not something Murphy was used to. It wasn't before long that the fight reached the streets from the confines of the station. The metallic monstrosities were determined to destroy each other, no matter the cost. Murphy was still trying to hold his punches when it came to collateral damage, but that was not Kong's way. He had been the same when he was a rehab, and now, with all this power, there was nothing that was going to stop his rampage. Murphy drew Kong back to the subway so that there could be a minimum of civilian casualties, but things seemed pretty bleak for Murphy. Not only did Kong try to melt him down, but Murphy even lost his weapon. Murphy had always been a man of action, someone who planned things well in advance, but things were not going as per plan this time around. The reason why he brought Kong to the subway was to have him mowed down by the next arriving train, but the exact opposite happened. The train ran over Murphy and he lay there seemingly dead, but of course he was wearing plot armor. On the other hand, Kong was still on his rampage and in kill mode. He killed several people, including civilians and OCP guys, but he stopped when a rehab turned his kill mode off. Once again, OCP was blaming the carnage on Murphy. They had simulations that showed Murphy killing civilians. However, people in the media and politicians were not willing to believe that this robot who had been cleaning out the slime and scumbags and making the streets safer for the people of Detroit suddenly had a nasty transformation, and so much so that he was killing nuns and little girls. And the frontrunner of this pro-Robocop campaign was the trash talk expert Spindle. However, Spindle was shot on camera. On the other hand, Robocop couldn't be found by OCP, and Kong was brought down to the station so that he could be reformatted. The new super dense disc contained a new program, which Dr. Love explained, were nothing short of extraordinary. Rather than simply placing parameters on the unit's behavior, the new program imposed entirely new personality, a human personality that translated into a living mind in essence. However, Dr. Love was not willing to disclose where exactly or which humans this new personality came from. But things went south for everyone when, instead of the new program being installed on Kong, all his previous memories were erased. Robocop has an enemy deadlier than Kong. Before the upload sequence could begin, something hit the building, and it came from the basement. Of course, it had to be Robocop who first took out the level 1 security before proceeding further. Robocop was violating his protocols while pointing guns at Dr. Love and an OCP official, but he was standing strong. Murphy wanted Dr. Love to erase the program she had installed in him, but she knew that all she had to do was wait. The pain would kill Murphy if he continued his hostility. In fact, he started to bleed because of this pain. However, the pain itself became Murphy's blessing in disguise as his list of directives got completely erased. He was back to being his own self. I guess he became more human than ever. Next, he went into the system that controlled Kong, destroying it completely. In a striking turn of events, Robocop left Dr. Love to die, but she installed the new program on Kong's body. It was now pretty clear that the personality she was earlier talking about was her own. She was now Robocop 2, a vicious and intelligent mind with a formidable body. Outside, the rehab guys were trying to kill Robocop by any means necessary, but the cyborg fled from the scene because he knew that not all battles had to be fought. However, Dr. Love pursued Robocop and used her cyborg body to stop Robocop's car. Additionally, Dr. Love was not discriminating between Robocop and rehab officers. As you can rightly understand, the rest of the story is going to be a sequence of high-octane fights between three opposing sides. Oh, and let's not forget the cops who were convinced by Lewis to join the fray. But things didn't seem to go well for the cops. Lewis had killed two of the rehab guys, and they were seeking revenge. 
while Lewis and her colleagues came to the situation to find more ammo for their war against rehab, and the latter were planning an assault. It was a setup, and many of the cops lost their lives. Snipers, grenades, bombs, and the rehabs had left no stone unturned to get what they wanted. One of the rookies panicked and stepped outside only to be tortured by the bad guys, and would have killed him if Robocop hadn't intervened. He and Lewis took out the rehabs on wheels, but a chopper showed up in the air. Murphy took charge of the situation and ordered everyone to take shelter. He bore the brunt but managed to bring the chopper down, but their problems were far from over as Dr. Love showed up. The Final Showdown Robocop was being evasive from Robocop 2 because he knew that in a battle of sheer power, the latter would win easily, so Robocop had to use his strategic and combat skills to win this one. He had been a cop for many years and a Robocop for more than a year. He was accustomed to such battles and was more skilled than a psychiatrist who had never been close to a fight. Dr. Love talked a lot. I'm not saying that she was a barking dog who seldom bit, but she did talk a lot. On the other hand, Murphy was trying to look for critical points in Dr. Love's armor. He found an opening in her gloves through which she shot explosive rounds. He targeted his fire at the opening and destroyed much of her arm. In retaliation, Dr. Love used her flamethrower against Murphy, but he managed to evade it, albeit after taking a little heat. Next, he found the tubes that supplied fluid to her flamethrower and took the shot. Robocop 2 was now severely injured. But Dr. Love was a resilient woman who was known for her determination and perseverance. The battle went on. Both the cyborgs were extremely injured, but none of them wanted to give up just yet. They still had a lot of fight left in them. Both the Robocops fell several stories down, gripped in the flame but still fighting for the upper hand. Murphy couldn't stand the thought of this crazy woman winning because that would have spelt doom for the old Detroit and its people. The fire had melted most of their armor, and once they crashed onto the ground, Murphy didn't have the strength to fight anymore. To his surprise and to ours, the day was saved by Lewis, who fired an RPG straight into Dr. Love. Robocop and Lewis shared a kiss before going MIA. On the other hand, Spindle had recovered from his injuries and was back at the show, assuring people that Robocop was still out there and was kicking OCP's butts. Marvelous Verdict Robocop 2 and Frank Miller's Robocop share several common elements in their plot lines. Both stories feature a police strike orchestrated by Omni Consumer Products, a damaged Robocop undergoing reprogramming to adhere to politically correct directives, and the introduction of Robocop 2 as an improved version by OCP. The comic adaptation of Frank Miller's Robocop also includes moments from Miller's original draft that made it onto the screen, such as new directives for Robocop and a memorable scene enforcing a no-smoking sign. Some of the script's commercial parodies also made their way into the film, including one animated by David Silverman for Robocop 3. While both versions share key concepts like Robocop's struggle with human emotions, OCP's reprogramming efforts, downsizing of the police force, and the introduction of a villainous Robocop 2, Miller's story takes a darker turn. In Miller's work, Robocop is rendered obsolete due to his lingering human emotions. OCP deploys ruthless mercenaries known as rehabs to maintain order in Detroit while they develop newer Robocops. Robocop finds himself not only battling criminals, but also facing off against the rehabs and his own replacement. The story culminates in a final showdown with the police confronting the rehabs and Robocop taking on Robocop 2. Miller's nine-issue miniseries faced delays and mixed reviews. Critics noticed its tired storyline and occasionally confusing art. Despite these shortcomings, the comic embraces the absurdity of the original film and offers humor, more gunfire, and explosions for fans less interested in satire. While it may not live up to its one-time reputation as a lost classic, Frank Miller's Robocop still provides fans with a long-awaited alternative take on the iconic character. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.